Thank you, uh, Olivier, for uh, inviting me to, to give a talk about the impact of nutritional factors on kidney stones. So, so let's start with the, most, uh, with the most important one, which is the intake of fluids. And as we all know, independent of the, uh, of the underlying cause of stones, if we dilute the urine, this would reduce the concentration of lithogenic salts and thus the probability of forming stones. So this is why the major guidelines would recommend a fluid intake that would achieve a urine volume of at least 2.5 liters per day. And in terms of uh, evidence, we have uh, a randomized controlled trial published in 1996, enrolling about 200 male first-time calcium oxalate stone formers randomized to either increase their water intake to, to obtain two liters per day of urine or uh, no changes. And at five years follow-up, there was uh, half the rate of, uh, about half the rate of recurrence in, uh, in the group treated with increased water intake. And the same authors showed <coughs> excuse me, that uh, by increasing um, water intake, increasing urine volume, there was, as it, as it would be expected, a significant reduction in uh, relative supersaturation for, uh, for calcium oxalate in this case. Uh, this, uh, this evidence was further confirmed in the health professional and the nurses' health studies, which have been uh, described earlier by Gary Curran. Uh, so this is a combined uh, analysis of uh, individual studies that have, be, have been published over time, uh, including uh, 233,595 participants, 3,560 incident uh, symptomatic first stones, uh, with over two, two uh, million person years of follow-up. And as you can see, increasing uh, quintiles of fluid intake were associated consistently with reduced risk of forming a stone, uh, ranging from uh, 0.8 to uh, about 0.7 uh, in terms of hazard ratio. Uh, but when we look at the, uh, the role of water composition, there is no, um, not, not a lot of evidence. Uh, this one, to the best of my knowledge, is the only uh, randomized controlled trial uh, which studied three, 384 recurrent idiopathic calcium stone formers who were randomized to either uh, Fuji water, which is an oligomineral uh, water, uh, with a calcium content of 15 milligrams per liter, or tap water with a higher content of calcium, with a mean follow-up of 19 months, uh, during which the rate uh, of recurrence was slightly lower using the oligomineral water, although not statistically significant. Uh, what we have is, the, is a number of small studies performed on uh, LT volunteers. For example, the study published by Dr. Sinner in 2004 on 12 uh, males with standardized diet uh, who underwent a five days control phase with fruit tea and then a test phase with mineral water with, uh, I would say, a very high content of bicarbonate and calcium. And what the authors found was that using the bicarbonate water was associated with, a, uh, with higher levels of citrate and pH throughout the day, not uh, surprisingly, but also was associated to a higher uh, urinary uh, calcium excretion. Uh, similarly, uh, there was a study published in 2007 on 34 calcium oxalate recurrent stone formers with a crossover design testing the effects of 1.5 liters uh, per day of mineral water or oligomineral water for three days. In this case, diet was recorded but not standardized. And after three days, the odor showed that urinary volume did not change between the two interventions, urinary pH increased, supersaturation for calcium oxalate did not change, calcium excretion and oxalate excretion did not change, and there was an increase in magnesium and citrate excretion with the bicarbonate water. Uh, what about the other fluids? We are often asked by patients what kind of fluids they can take to, to achieve the, the total volume. Uh, we have this randomized control trial uh, performed on about 1,000 male stone formers, 
who consumed uh, quite a large amount of soft drinks daily. And these were randomized to either refrain from soft drink consumption or no intervention. Follow-up was maximum at three years, after which the recurrence free rate was 75% in the active group uh, and 58% in the control group, and it was statistically significant, meaning that refraining from soft drink was beneficial for these patients. Uh, we also looked at this um, these association between uh, type of beverage and the risk of a first kidney stone uh, using the data from the health professional and nurses health cohorts. And uh, in all the three cohorts, uh, you can see that uh, with increasing categories of intake, the risk of forming a stone would increase um, linearly with about 20 to 35 percent higher risk of stones uh, among those uh, taking one uh, or more servings per day compared with those taking less than one per week. Uh, what we also found is that some beverages seem to be potentially protective, in particular coffee, decaffeinated coffee, tea and orange juice were associated with a um, um, lower risk of stones. And the same was true for red wine, white wine and beer in this study. So we do not discourage uh, our patients to, to drink this kind of beverages. So moving to calcium, of course, this is another key, uh, key factor since uh, most stones are made up of calcium. And this is, uh, as you all know, the, uh, the main report of, uh, of, a, of an association between uh, dietary intake of calcium and the risk of stone uh, in the study performed by Gary Curran in, uh, published in 1993. And uh, different from what was the, the mainstream view at the time, there was an inverse uh, association so calcium, calcium intake is protective for kidney stones. Uh, and uh, this was further confirmed in an updated analysis of the same cohort and in additional analysis of, uh, of new cohorts. And uh, again, as you can see, calcium intake uh, was associated with a, with a reduced risk of forming stones over time. Uh, and this was finally sanctioned in a randomized controlled trial enrolling 120 male recurrent calcium oxalate hypercalcuric stone formers randomized to either low calcium diet or a multi-component diet including normal calcium, low animal protein, and low salt. And at five years, there was, again, uh, people in the low calcium group uh, had almost double accumulative incidence of recurrence uh, during follow-up. The, uh, the same models showed that the, uh, a low calcium diet, similarly to a normal calcium diet, was associated with a reduction in urinary calcium excretion at one week. Uh, but where the, uh, they differed was in terms of urinary excretion of oxalate with the low calcium diet associated um, with, a, with an increase in urinary oxalate and a reduction in urinary oxalate for normal calcium. Uh, and this will result in a significant reduction in relative supersaturation for calcium oxalate for those taking a normal calcium. This is likely due to the effect of uh, chelation of uh, calcium um, in the, uh, of, of oxalate from, from diet by calcium, as has been shown in uh, uh, previous studies in LT participants consuming diets with uh, uh, varying amounts of calcium and oxalate. Uh, opposite to what we have seen for, uh, for dietary calcium, supplemental calcium does not seem to be beneficial in terms of stone risk. Uh, and the, the point estimates for the published studies also suggest that it can be, uh, can, it can be actually harmful. And this is probably due to the timing of ingestion of supplements which are usually taken outside of meals so uh, they do not achieve the uh, chelation effect on, uh, on dietary oxalate. Uh, it doesn't seem to be related to the dietary source of calcium since uh, Eric Taylor and Gary Curran looked at this uh, and uh, showed that dairy and, and non-dairy sources of calcium are associated with a similar 
uh, risk profile in terms of, of risk of stones. So oxalate, uh, this has been uh, shown already. Uh, uh, this is the analysis of the health professional nurses health studies. Uh, as opposed to dietary calcium, there is not uh, a, a very strong uh, association with oxalate intake. It, it is moderate in terms of magnitude of association, and it's also non-significant in one of the cohorts, in the cohorts composed of younger women. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is not necessarily a strong risk factor, a dietary risk factor for stone. Animal protein is classically seen as a uh, risk factor for, for stones, even though we have seen previously the, the multi-component study by Professor Borghi. And uh, again, this, this one is the, uh, the only other randomized control trial looking at recurrence. Uh, uh, randomizing 175 uh, idiopathic calcium stone former uh, patients to a low animal protein, uh, high fever or control, and they showed that there were basically no difference in terms of recurrence, even though this study was plugged by a quite high dropout rate. Uh, and also in the observational uh, settings, we can see uh, that the analysis of the health professional and nurses health cohorts uh, did not report a strong uh, in, or consistent association uh, for animal protein um, in any of the cohorts analyzed. So one possible explanation for this might be that animal protein is, uh, has different sources. So we looked at uh, animal protein split into dairy and animal non-dairy um, sources. And as you can see, dairy protein seems to be associated with a trend toward a decreased risk, or at least that there doesn't seem to be a higher risk uh, with increasing uh, intakes of dairy, of dairy protein, whether this association seems to be, seems to be uh, more consistent for animal non-dairy protein, at least in two out of three cohorts, whereas vegetable protein doesn't seem to be uh, associated with, uh, with risk of stones. Fruits and vegetables is another, uh, is another important aspect. Uh, so if, you, if we look at intake of potassium as a marker of, uh, of intake of fruits and vegetables, we can see that there is a consistent uh, association, uh, inverse association with risk of stones uh, with uh, those participants in the highest quintiles showing a risk uh, up to um, five, um, 50% lower compared with those in the, in the lowest quintile. Uh, when we look at animal protein and potassium together as, a, uh, as they interact, we, mi we might consider them as, a, uh, as the main components of the uh, net endogenous acid production. In fact, animal protein are precursors of, um, uh, of acid, whereas potassium salts are usually metabolized to bicarbonate. So in the literature, uh, several authors use the ratio of animal protein to potassium as a, uh, as a marker of net acid load from diet. So we did the same uh, using data from the health professionals and nurses health cohorts. And as you can see, even uh, after adjusting for the main effects of animal protein and potassium, the ratio of the two would still be significantly associated with an increased risk of stones, meaning that they're, uh, they're inter not only their uh, absolute amounts, but also their interaction, their relative amounts, uh, seem to have a role in, the, in stone disease. We also uh, looked at the subgroup with 24-hour uh, urines available, and um, unsurprisingly, the amount of citrate uh, excreted and urine pH uh, went lower uh, for higher um, intakes of net acid load. Uh, when we look at salt, we are interested because we know that uh, there is an association between excretion of sodium, which is a function of uh, intake of salt, and 24-hour urinary calcium excretion, uh, which has been shown in, uh, in uh, different studies. And we also have a study <coughs> excuse me, published in 2010 uh, on 210 hypercalciuric idiopathic calcium stone formers, 
uh, who were randomized to either hydration alone uh, versus hydration plus low salt for three months. And the other showed that there was a net reduction in urinary uh, calcium excretion. Uh, urinary oxalate uh, went low slightly, even though urine volume uh, was uh, unchanged between the two groups. Uh, in, the, in the large cohorts, there is no uh, a real consistent signal in terms of salt because in the Women's Health Initiative cohort, there was a higher risk uh, of, of stones, so about 61% in the highest quintile of salt intake, but there was no association between salt intake and risk of incident stones in their professionals and in the nurses' health cohorts. A possible explanation is that salt intake might be difficult to estimate by FFQ. In fact, if we look in these cohorts at the uh, risk associated with uh, urinary sodium excretion, we found a, a direct association. Uh, fructose is another important aspect to consider, and this is the rationale, because ra uh, we know that rats fed high fructose diet show higher urinary calcium, higher rates of nephrocalcinosis compared with rats fed high starch, and also in human, uh, consuming high fructose is associated with higher urinary calcium excretion. It's been shown that infusing fructose increases urinary oxalate by 60%, so uh, uh, this is uh, a, a dietary factor that has to be uh, considered. And in fact, uh, as shown, uh, the intake of fructose, uh, increasing in the intake of fructose is associated in their professional and nurses' health cohorts uh, with a linear increase in, in risk of forming a first stone. Finally, I would like to show um, some data on dietary patterns because in the practice, it's usually difficult to, uh, to manipulate single nutrients. And, and in this case, it, it might be easier to, um, to look at, at the pattern of, of nutrients. And the patterns that are relevant for kidney stones are the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, which are quite similar. Uh, they overlap quite a bit. And regarding the DASH diet, there is uh, evidence from the uh, health professional and nurses' health cohorts uh, of a consistent uh, inverse association between uh, quintiles of DASH score, which have been calculated based on intakes of fruits, vegetables, nuts and legumes, low-fat dairies, whole grains, low intakes of sodium, red or processed meats, and sweetened beverages. Um, regarding the effect on uh, urine composition, it, it seems to be uh, rather complex. In fact, uh, uh, those with a high DASH score diet uh, tended to have higher urinary calcium and urine oxalate, but also higher urine citrate, significantly higher urine volume, and higher urine pH. So as a, uh, as a, as a result, in these cohorts, there, were a, there was a lower relative silver saturation value for calcium oxalate, at least in two out of the three cohorts, and for uric acid. Uh, we have also a study uh, comparing the effect of a um, uh, DASH diet and low oxalate diet in 41 hyperoxaluric calcium oxalate stone formers, and the <coughs> The authors reported that after eight weeks, there was no change in urinary calcium. Urinary oxalate went slightly lower uh, for low oxalate diet, but urinary citrate went, uh, went significantly higher for the DASH diet. So there was a trend towards a re uh, reduction in calcium oxalate relative supersaturation for the DASH diet compared with the low oxalate, although the numbers are not very large. Uh, finally, there is th this uh, recently published paper uh, performed on a Spanish cohort followed with biennial questionnaire and an FFQ at baseline and at, five e at 10 years. They computed a Mediterranean diet score based on ratio of mono to saturated fatty acids, legumes, cereals, fruit and nuts, vegetables and fish, and moderate intake of alcohol, low meat and low milk and dairies. 
kidney stones was self-reported in this study, and the odors in this sample of about 242,000 participants with 735 incident stones reported a um, lower risk of stones for higher uh, Mediterranean score categories of about 40% lower in the highest category. Uh, finally, I would like to show you this uh, very recent results from, uh, from a study that we have performed on the uh, health professional and nurses health cohorts, looking at uh, trace metal and risk of a first stone, because there was evidence, especially from, uh, from a preclinical side, uh, that zinc intake might be related to, might be somehow involved in the pathogenesis of stones. So we looked at total intakes, dietary plus supplements, of not only zinc, but also iron, copper, and manganese. And as you can see, for zinc, the association was pretty null, and it's the same for iron. There was a suggestion of a higher uh, risk for increasing uh, intakes of copper, but this disappeared when looking at dietary intakes. Whereas there was a, a trend towards a, a lower risk of stones uh, across intakes of manganese, uh, which was also consistent when looking at dietary manganese, and, um, uh, and this was, uh, again, consistent in all, in all the cohorts. So, I think I've finished, and I thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Manuel. Are there, are there questions? Should we stop now recommending uh, mineral water to our patients? The tap water you, is enough. Do you recommend? No. Mineral? Yeah, we recommend. You highly recommend? We, we recommend, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, as I showed you, the only trial that looked at the uh, recurrence rate uh, as a function of the uh, water composition was null. So I think it might be useful in, uh, based on the patient that you have in front of you if you want to achieve uh, alkalinization because the patient has like uric acid stones or, or you want to achieve a higher urine citrate, but the evidence is not uh, is not strong in terms of recurrence rates. Is there something you want to add, Bernie? <laughs> we rather recommend high calcium mineral waters to avoid oxalate hyperabsorption. And the number one product stands up there in front of you. The calcium richest mineral water in Switzerland. Okay. Do you, um, do you recommend it outside of meals as well, because we are, we are looking at, we are doing a study right now looking at the uh, differential effects of different kinds of water um, at meals and outside of meals, because ideally you might want to, to, to suggest the patient to take an oligomineral water outside of meals if, if the, the effort that you are trying to convey is the chelation of oxalate. I recommend to my patients to use these mineral waters always when they eat anything, because okay. oxalate is always okay. there. If they have to hydrate themselves in between, they can drink beer or tap water okay. or whatever. Okay. Beer, prefer preferably. Well, uh, could you maybe comment on, on the effect of fructose? I was just wondering how, how come uh, there is more calciuria and oxaluria? Uh, was, uh, oh, so, yes, yeah, so, some authors uh, report of, uh, suggest that the effect would be uh, uh, based on an, a higher absorption uh, from the gut, of calcium from the gut, whereas others report a, a tubular effect, uh, but it's not, it's not clear. Okay, then we continue. Thank you.